and, and welcome everybody. Thanks for coming on this wet, rainy day. Um, I come from Manchester, and you've given me monkey and rain. I just said it's blue skies in Manchester, so thank you for making me feel at home. And thank you to everybody who's also watching us online. This, I have to admit, this is the first event that I've shared where which is a hybrid event, so forgive me if I'm a little rusty and new to the format. Um, uh, this uh, seminar is called uh, Exploring Research and Hidden Histories of HIV. For those of you who think you're in the wrong place, that's your chance to go, but uh, hopefully you're in the right place. Um, so my name's Paul, I'll be chairing the session today. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. Um, and I'll also start with just a brief audio description of myself for those uh, who would find it useful. Um, you can't tell, maybe you saw when I stood up, but I'm six foot one. I have a, a, a bulk head that I like to say is shaved, because it's a lot of upkeep. And today I'm wearing a white shirt, a grey jacket, blue jeans, and I'm on the blue chair, uh, in the, the nice uh, blue chair in the welcome. And so we're here in the forum with my lovely colleagues here, I'll introduce you to in a moment. Um, just a little bit about me. I am, first of all, not a professional historian. I am not uh, an academic. I, can, I know there are plenty of those in the audience. Um, so uh, forgive me if I am not using the exact correct lexicon for some of the stuff that you've got the experts here to do that. Um, I do work in uh, health communications. I, um, at the moment, I'm the Associate Director of Communications in Greater Manchester, working in mental health. Um, but for the last 20 years or so, I've worked in HIV and sexual health. And until about this time last year, I was the, um, the head of the London HIV Prevention Programme, which was a programme intended to prevent HIV, which included a large social marketing and campaigns element, a little bit like you saw from these historic campaigns. Um, my training was actually originally in uh, HIV. I was a volunteer uh, in HIV prevention when I was doing my master's many, many years ago, 20 years ago. Um, and then I worked in a sexual health promotion service in down in Brighton. And actually soon after I, I finished uh, my graduate internship, um, I worked in a service in Brighton which was called Open Door. It doesn't exist anymore. But it was a service for people who were newly diagnosed with HIV um, and also for those who've been living with it for a very long time. And around that time, 2003, 2004, um, I started to see pa patients, clients, service users who were coming through the, wow, you've all just done very well. <laughs> um, I started to see service users coming through the door who were predominantly uh, black African heterosexual women. Um, and that was a big shift in the demographic of the patients that we were seeing, that, that my colleagues were seeing before that, and to the long-standing cohort of uh, service users that we had prior to that. And that was quite an interesting picture into the changing demographic, the changing epidemiology of HIV in the UK at that time. Most of those women were diagnosed at a very late stage of infection. They uh, were diagnosed predominantly through antenatal testing, um, and they'd been born in sub-Saharan African countries. So it, it was a very different picture, and the picture has changed, and as, as you'll probably hear and we'll see through this session, um, sometimes some groups get more attention than others when we talk about the history of the epidemic. Um, I then worked uh, for a while at the BBC, I trained as a journalist, and I, I was always doing covering health stories, um, and then in 2009 I rejoined, I joined the NHS, where I worked as a, a sexual health promotion specialist, specialising in HIV, specifically for men who have sex with men, down in Lambeth and Southwark, until uh, about 10 years ago when I started the London-wide HIV job. So I've, I've had a, bit, a, a long uh, history of a career working in HIV, and I've seen quite a lot of changes, and just talking to people in the room today, I feel incredibly old because I've seen and I remember some of those campaigns from the first time they were produced. Um, and my interest is specifically in the communications around public health, how we do the art of the science of public health. And I know that we've already lived through this period where we've all become much more exposed to public health messaging in the last few years, inevitably because of the pandemic. Although the one thing I would say is that uh, public health messaging does not consist of three-word slogans, and we all live through some, some of those. Um, enough about me, a little bit about the Welcome. Uh, so for those not familiar with the Welcome Collection, it's a free museum and library that aims to challenge how we all think and feel about health, by connecting science, medicine, life, and art. And it's a global charitable foundation which supports science to solve the urgent health challenges that we, that we all face. And this afternoon's event forms part of a program of events intended to platform current and topical research that has been based around the collections here at The Welcome. And actually, my association with The Welcome goes back over a decade when Julia, who, who's sitting in the audience here, you'll hear more later, is, 
is manning the, um, manning the talk, the live talk chat, aren't you? So Julia was working on the digitized, uh, the, uh, the welcome digitized, a huge collection of HIV related posters and public health campaigns back, I think it was 2009 10. And I came in and started teaching local teenagers about the history of HIV and about modern HIV prevention, using those as a tool to, to really look at the history and the contemporary picture of HIV. And, and if you haven't already done it, I recommend that you check out their permanent and their current exhibitions. Every time I come to this place, I always learn something new. It's a really great uh, museum space. Some housekeeping. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to run briefly through how we're going to run the event, because we've got a live audience at home, as, or at work potentially, as well as in, in the room today. So this is being live streamed, and it will be available to watch again uh, afterwards on the Welcome Collections YouTube channel. I think that people are watching via YouTube right now. And hello again to our live stream audience, it's nice to have you with us. Um, your cameras and microphones will be off, but you can engage in the chat, um, and hopefully you can see us all right and hear us. Um, we also have live speech to text, which is provided by Voicebox, which is that thing to my, to my left. And the captions are on, and the online attendees can also see the live stream. And we will also be audio describing this event, I think, after the event. This is about 75 minutes long. We'll have 25 minute presentations by our speakers, and then an interactive Q&A, both with you in the room and with people watching uh, online. Uh, and as I say, it's interactive, so we would love to hear what you think. Uh, Note down your, your thoughts and put them in the chat. If you're here in person during the Q&A, we'll be sharing a microphone, and I'll just come to you uh, when you're called. If you'd rather not ask something verbally, there are cards, I think, share your thoughts, I think they're still on there, um, and you can write those down, give them to member staff, and I may have time to read some of those out. For those of you online, you can chat, comment, and ask questions through the YouTube chat, and there's a moderator who will pass those through and send them to me so that we, we get the, the, the best of them read out if we possibly can. Of course, this afternoon is intended to be both exciting, educational, informative, and positive. And so we want to make sure that this is a, a safe space for everyone to participate. So I just remind you, all both in the room and at home, to be respectful and, and please no offensive comments uh, in the chat. And if you are online and struggling, I'm looking at the camera, and I'm not over your heads, but I am looking at the people at home. If you're online and struggling with anything, then please do drop a note in the chat so that one of our technical people can just sort that out for you. because. Um, I don't have a screen, so I don't know if it's going wrong. So, that brings us to the event itself. And today we'll be discussing what might be called the hidden histories of uh, people affected during the HIV and AIDS epidemic. And we'll be hearing from Janet and Hannah, who will share their research, which explores the stories of people who are often missing from mainstream narratives about those infected with and affected by HIV. In the UK and in Europe, and you've probably noticed a number of particularly German uh, posters in, in that collection there. And so the, these in, uh, this includes people living and working in prisons, drug users, sex workers, social workers, mothers and children, and others as well. And online audiences will have received a link for the poster collection that the team uh, here at the Welcome put together. And by the way, thank you so much for doing that, the, the people at the back there. That was a great um, collection. It was beautifully uh, uh, curated as well. And those posters, as I said, are drawn from the Welcome's own collection of HIV uh, campaigns through the history of the epidemic. Um, and I, I would just add, as someone whose job it was until very recently to produce mass media, mass marketing campaigns, which used to be in tube stations and on bus stops and all sorts of things, you probably aren't quite aware of how much work and thought goes into producing these sorts of campaigns, or at least it should go into them. And when they go wrong, you probably have seen public health campaigns that go wrong. Um, and when I look back at my, the campaigns that I worked on between 2015 and 2021, I'm, I'm struck actually how of their time they were, um, and it's quite strange how fast uh, the history of HIV has moved on quite quickly in terms of new treatments and different groups that we try to target. But of course, I would just also point out that it's not just the visual <coughs> account, it's also the placement, it's the reach, and it's where we put those campaigns. And so that's a really important element of the story of the narrative around HIV. But anyway, I'm sure we're going to cover this later. For now, I'm going to introduce you to our two speakers who are itching to get, well, actually say seated and talk to you. So uh, Dr. Hannah Elizabeth is a research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, just around the corner, um, and a cultural historian of health, sexuality, and childhood in Britain. They're currently working on a welcome-funded fellowship investigating how HIV-affected people 
built and maintained families in Edinburgh and influenced national and international policy and practice through daily acts of love, care and activism. And their most recent publication from the project is uh, Recovering Mother's Experience of HIV AIDS Health Activism in Edinburgh 1983-2000. to And they publish widely on the history of British public health, education and teenage sexual health. And we were just having a really great chat about some of the 90s teen magazines that I used to look at when I was a teenager myself, um, which used to cover sex, sexual health in a way that I don't think teenagers get today, but we'll come on to that, I'm sure. And Dr. Janet Weston is an assistant professor in, in the Centre for History at the Public, uh, uh, Cent sorry, Centre for History and Public Health, also at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And she's interested in the histories of health in modern Britain, particularly in relation to mental illness, sexuality, population health, and the law. And she's researched and written about the history of HIV AIDS in prisons and edited with Hannah the collections, the, the collection History of HIV AIDS in Western Europe, New and Regional Perspectives. And her latest book is Looking After Miss Alexander, Care, Mental Capacity and the Court of Protection in Mid-20th Century England. Wow, I feel really intimidated now, but we shouldn't be, so we're in good hands. So I think we're going to start with Hannah's presentation. Yeah, so I'm just going to give a brief description of myself. Um, I've got red hair, I'm wearing a green plaid shirt and uh, black jeans and a pair of very beaten up Doc Martens. Um, so yeah, I'm a cultural historian of health and sexuality um, and my main kind of area of expertise is HIV and AIDS but I have also kind of looked at wider public health and histories of childhood and stuff as we said. So we've not got masses of time so I'm going to very quickly try and showcase some AIDS activism um, that women engaged in um, which doesn't really tend to feature in the kind of mainstream narratives of the history of HIV that kind of make it onto our TVs or into our kind of broad street newspapers. And I'm going to make the argument that there's absolutely no excuse for any of these omissions. Uh, women have always been involved in AIDS activism and plenty of great scholars have documented this. And whilst the title of our session today is Hidden Histories, and part of what, like, part of what me and Janet are going to try and make clear today is that these are hid they're hidden, but they're not hidden. They're archives that have all of this stuff. They're, there's people with memories of all of this activism and these lives lived. Some of them are even histories that were documented by the popular press at the time in national as well as more kind of niche and regional presses it might be better to say that these are histories which have been forgotten or histories that are less told or sometimes histories that have been ignored. So these are sometimes what I would like to think of as the, the histories that fit kind of awkwardly alongside the kind of more mainstream narratives that um, we may be a little bit more familiar with. So is this going to work? No. Nope. I'm going to Chris Whitty. Next slide, please. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so my first kind of lesser told history, if you will, of women's AIDS activism is around queer women's AIDS activism. Now, it's obviously been well documented that queer women were really involved with the fight to prevent the social and medical harms associated with HIV and AIDS from the very beginning of the AIDS crisis. Their role of, as allies, agitators and carers for queer men is really well documented. But I want to give you a little taste of a slightly lesser known aspect of queer women's AIDS activism. The activism that was directed at preventing the spread of HIV amongst queer women and women more generally. So I'm going to give you a very rapid history of lesbian safer sex in the 1980s and 1990s. Next slide please. <laughs> um, and then my second case study I'm going to look at um, aid, the AIDS activism of HIV affected mothers. So mums who were living with HIV themselves or those who had children who were living with the virus. So here I'm going to be focusing on um, Edinburgh-based activism, so drawn from my like, current research, which, um, should, which should give you a kind of more regional idea of what was going on with AIDS activism. Again, this is going to be quite brief, but I'm perfectly happy to answer questions um, and go into a little bit of depth. Uh, later on. So next slide please. Alright, so lesbian safer sex. Uh, pejoratively dubbed latex lesbians uh, by their naysayers emerged in the sort of 1980s in North America 
as part of wider attempts to meet women's safer sex needs. So in the 1980s, lesbian safer sex practices emerged alongside heterosexual women's safer sex practices, with an emphasis on condom use, which acknowledged that some lesbians had sex with cis men, calls to end needle sharing during drug use, and you know, advice to reduce the number of sexual partners. This is all kind of promoted alongside some more specific sexual practices aimed at cis lesbians specifically. So while safer sex was and is a complex set of changing and culturally specific set of practices, activism among queer women was galvanised by the contested need for the dental dam. So in the interest of time, I'm going to zoom in on dental dams for this little case study on lesbian safer sex activism. Um, but, like I said, Lesbian Safe for Sex constituted a really wide variety of practices, not limited to just using dental dams. It drew on other kind of safer sex practices adopted by the wider queer and heterosexual sex worker and SM communities. And queer sexual health advice aimed at women included, but was not limited to the open discussion of kind of sexual histories, use of other barrier methods such as gloves, condoms, finger cots, the dangers of biophobia, ways to make safer sex sexy, regular health checks, smears, caring hygienically for your sex toys, what have you. But I'm just going to zoom in on dental dams. Next slide, please. <coughs> so the first dental dam was a repurposed rubber barrier that was originally intended for use by dentists, um, probably in use since sort of the kind of uh, mid-1800s. So these dams were originally used to protect dentists and patients from any kind of contamination occurring during dental surgery. So they're designed to isolate teeth um, that are being drilled. Now for sexual purposes, the rubber barrier was intended to be placed over your required body parts um, during oral sex. So stretched across the entire vulva or the anus and held in place with fingers. The first dam during oral sex. Now, as the quotes on the screen make clear, the, the repurposed nature created issues for would-be dam users. Unlike condoms, they've not been tested or designed for sexual purposes and were not as intuitive to use as a condom. Moreover, getting hold of them was much more difficult than acquiring condoms. They were far more expensive. You could only usually buy them individually or maybe in a pack of three if you were lucky. Um, and you couldn't usually get them unless you pretended to be a dental business when they first came out. So there's all these stories of sexual health activists calling up dental clinics and claiming, and dental suppliers claiming to be dental clinics so that they could bulk buy dental dams and then subsequently give them out to people. Um, they also often had an unpleasant taste and smell. Some people might remember that condoms used to have quite a strong smell. This was even more intense. Um, and they were also uh, dusted in talcum powder, which needed to be washed off before use. Because of all these issues, part of lesbian safer sex activism was focused on improving the dental dam, increasing its availability, um, and in the case of UK activists, agitating for their promotion and free availability through the public health arms of the welfare state. So they thought, you know, if you can get condoms by the NHS, or if you can get uh, condoms promoted by the Health Education Authority, why not dental dams? Transnationally, queer women lobbied condom producers to create purpose-made dental dams, agitating for research into their efficaciousness as barriers. Um, British Rubber was asked to do it, but they're obviously the big kind of condom makers around here, they declined, but Passante did start producing dental dams for the European market. Um, but they couldn't prove they worked to prevent the transmission of STDs, so they had to stop making them because under EU law you can't make a medical device that you can't prove works. Um, so, well, um, so they didn't really take off round here, in, in, but they did take off elsewhere. Whilst dental dams took off substantially as a technology of safer sex in some countries, notably they were given out in Australian prisons, um, Australian women's prisons, they saw no government action in the UK. Uh, we were in fact challenged by one of Britain's most prominent AIDS charities. Next slide please. So the Terence Higgins Trust, feeling that the use of latex barriers during sex between women was distracting from the ways 
that cis women were more likely to be at risk brought out uh, what became an infamous Ditch the Dental Dam campaign. They argued that rather than trying to reduce what they argued was a negligible risk to absolutely zero, people should be having open and honest conversations about more high-risk activities that lesbians were engaging in. Um, so they wanted people to have more conversations about uh, lesbians having sex with heterosexual men or, or using drugs or um, uh, going forward with artificial insemination, etc. The problem was that AIDS activists and advocates of lesbian safer sex in America thoroughly disagreed with this approach. At an AIDS conference in Amsterdam, the THT was actually zapped by American act up activists who they accused of murdering lesbians. Um, this, is, this became very well documented in the queer press. It wasn't really covered by the mainstream press, but it was, you know, it was in the pink paper and things like that, um, that this had all gone down. Other slightly more kind of sanguine responses to the, to the THT campaign um, were adopted by queer women who just kind of chose a counter narrative which emphasised that low risk isn't no risk, taking on the message of, of a more open conversation about different risky activities, but also giving space to those who wanted to continue using dental dams, um, making sure that those other latex barriers were still seen as part of like different ways of doing lesbian safer sex and were still kind of an acceptable practice. Now, if you were a queer woman in the 1980s and 1990s with a subscription to any of the kind of queer newsletters or magazines, this would not have been a hidden story. This was big news. Indeed, some have argued that dental dams were more talked about than used. Lots of sexual health uh, promoters would sort of admit to one another that they spent a lot of time telling people to use dental dams, but they weren't necessarily using them themselves. Um, but unlike the lauded and well-documented rise of the condom, the rise and fall, and maybe it's still a thing, uh, the history of the dental dam and the activists who fought over it has barely made a footnote into most histories of uh, safer sex in the UK. Um, and when it comes to kind of sexual health in our presence, we've largely forgotten the dental dam. They very rarely appear in kind of sex education curriculums in schools and. A lot of people don't know what they are. If you ask them in a sexual health clinic, your doctor might not know what it is. They're not, they, they, we haven't just forgotten the history, we've kind of forgotten the dental dam in its entirety. Um, although it has had a, a, a slight rise in popularity in recent times, interestingly. Okay, so that's my little short potted history of the, of the lesbian safer sex through the object history of the dental dam. So I'm now gonna move on to um, another set of women involved in AIDS activism. So next slide, please. Okay, so another group of women involved in AIDS activism was HIV-affected mothers. In the case that I'm going to talk about, I'm thinking about HIV-affected mothers living in Edinburgh. But why pay so much attention to Scotland, and why Edinburgh specifically? So Scotland's experience of HIV and AIDS, whilst regionally and internationally inflected and influential, was demographically, culturally and politically distinctive. Of those with HIV in Scotland, by 1991, 63% had contracted the virus through either heterosexual intercourse or needle sharing, versus around 24% of those living with HIV in the UK at the same time, the general population. And Edinburgh as a city was disproportionately affected um, by the HIV AIDS crisis in the early 1980s and 1990s, earning it the unhappy title in many a broadsheet newspaper of AIDS capital of Europe. So this was very, very often the way that the city was speak spoken about. Edinburgh's uh, crisis followed a different pattern from that which was unfolding in London with new infections predominantly occurring amongst IV drug users and heterosexual became very interesting to the newspapers and became part of the kind of popular understanding of this history. Um, so by 1985, 50% of known injecting drug users, meaning those who'd been engaged by social, medical, and criminal justice workers, were thought to be HIV positive within Edinburgh City. Um, and by 1987, Edinburgh accounted for 30% of all recorded cases of HIV among women in the UK. So it wasn't just a different kind of demographic in terms of more drug users, it was also seemingly the majority of women living with HIV in the UK. So 
by 1993, given that there were all these women with HIV, there were also 500 known, so known to the statutory services, HIV-affected children with complex needs living in Edinburgh. So these are the either children who are living themselves with HIV or children of families affected by HIV. So as a result, Edinburgh became a hub of activism and expertise as, H as the HIV affected and those that cared for them scrambled to address these previously unmet needs. Okay, so I'm about to discuss a really horrible Daily Mail article, so you've all been warned. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just going to begin by examining this um, article which featured in the paper's uh, women's supplement, Female, because it offers a very typical example of the way that Edinburgh's AIDS crisis was represented in the popular press. And as a historian, we've got to kind of pay attention to articles like this precisely because they're exactly the kind of problematic documents from which researchers can seek to recover the voices of mothers that were living with HIV at this time. And they offer in a highly mediated fashion, glimpses of some of the factors which shaped the experiences and kind of activism of women living in a, with HIV in Edinburgh in this period, revealing the context which made the kind of resources that I'm going to look at with you guys and the activism that they show, like, necessary. But also because I think as much as this is a, a problematic article, appearing in the mainstream press as an HIV-positive mother is an act of remarkable bravery in this time period. This is extremely stigmatized. So we might not see the kind of disclosure that is framed by a nasty Daily Mail article as activism traditionally, but the, the, this, this, take this act of disclosure, this making oneself visible, to me is a form of activism. So according to this article, and I'm quoting now, innocent baby, little Jamie, is one of 29 babies to be infected in the womb because of a parent's drug abuse. So this is firmly placing the responsibility on his quote-unquote frail mother and her drug addict husband. So Jamie's mother, Lorraine, is then quoted in confirmation of this guilt. Every morning I wake up and I blame myself. It makes me angry that Jamie has been the innocent victim of our drug abuse. So here we can see the way that the Daily Mail is making personal culpability for the spread of HIV, kind of something that's it's the parents' fault, and also we're getting this kind of setup between innocent children and kind of culpable adults. We're then told that Lorraine is just one of a growing number of Scottish heroin users who've made Edinburgh's Britain's drug and AIDS capital. So we get this real idea that there's certain people that are involved in this spread. And then this is when we get to the kind of the nub of the article. We're told. It's in Edinburgh that the most tragic maternity clinic in the country is to be found. Ward 7A at the, at the Edinburgh City Hospital appears at first sight to be like any other postnatal clinic with the sounds of baby's laughter filling the room, but all over lies a pervading sense of terror and guilt. Okay, so we, we see this, this space where we know that care is happening, we know that people are being looked after, we know from the history we know that this is uh, actually quite a remarkable hospital ward where there's a lot of innovation taking place, but that's obviously not the story that we're getting. We're getting this dark narrative that we're probably quite familiar with. We're then introduced to Sylvia, who tells us about her worries for the future as an HIV-affected mother. She says, the day I have to tell him he has AIDS, how do you tell a wee boy that he's only got 50% chance of life? And how do you tell him that it's all mum and dad's fault? So now we have this kind of nub of the issue when it comes to this interaction between the mothers and their children. What, what do you tell the children? How do you tell them? What do you say? So worries about how to disclose to children um, that they and their parents were living with HIV and AIDS was such a common experience in Edinburgh that by the 1990s, a variety of texts had been created to help HIV-affected parents make such disclosures many published by the Paediatric AIDS Resource Centre, which emerged around the kind of hospitals and clinics in Edinburgh, attempting to meet the needs of these HIV-affected families. For Sylvia, as one of the first identified HIV-positive mothers, such resources did not yet exist. Um, but as I'm going to move on to now, eventually, HIV-positive mo mothers were at the kind of vanguard of creating new um, resources 
Can I move on to the next slide? I'm just going to kind of quickly. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> um, so this is um, a, a kind of just to give you a kind of different perspective. No, obviously, it wasn't just HIV positive mothers, but also the mums of adults um, who had contracted HIV. So these were kind of the, the adult parents of adult children living with HIV. So this is one of um, my favourite acts of small activism that we don't necessarily know about, partly because of the scale. So the Citywide Family Support Group was set up in 1985 by an HIV-affected mother when she realised that her experiences were rel uh, relevant to other parents. So she'd been going to a bunch of kind of support groups for parents of uh, IV drug using uh, children. And she realised that she'd kind of developed quite a lot of expertise in you know, supporting her husband, supporting her children, supporting her friends. And she decided to set up a kind of support group out of her home and a lot of the time it was just about like offering people cups of tea and giving them a number that they could call and be like, I'm really angry with my child or I'm really sad or I'm really worried or what have you. Um, and it's extremely small scale activism that's born out of kind of these personal, personal experiences. It was entirely run by volunteers and it had no kind of extra funding, but it was all about trying to create a safe, familial kind of space where the parents of adult drug using kids could go and kind of chat about their experiences and hopefully feel kind of safe to share and air their emotions. So then my final point is this, next slide please, is um, one of my favourite all time things which anyone can have a look at, the welcome also do have a copy, which is a picture book which was written by an HIV positive mum. And much like the Daily Mail article, she announced that she was an HIV positive mother in writing it, but this is um, a, a, a book created to kind of script those uncomfortable how do you tell your children about HIV conversations. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's an act of disclosure. It was about making HIV positive mothers and HIV uh, positive children visible. But it's also a picture book that allowed children to kind of learn in a safe way about what would happen if they went to an HIV clinic for their routine medical checkups that they would be having every three and six months, sometimes with their parents, sometimes without. Um, so for me, it's kind it kind of crystallizes the activism that we can see was needed from that horrible Daily Mail article, but also the kind of the activism that is quiet and um, easily forgotten because it, um, partly the, the, the same needs have kind of um, been eclipsed by other things. And this is a very Edinburgh story. This is this this picture book even has bits that look like the Edinburgh clinics that were kind of present at the time. Um, I think I'll wrap up there. For now, for now, <laughs> oh, for now, we'll come back. I'm sure. Thank you very much. Let's show some appreciation for that. It's so rich. <laughs> Thank you. We will come back to some detail. I have a very, very quick... I'm not going to take questions, but this is Chair's privilege. What year was that published out of interest, oh that book? I can't remember. Let me just look. check the title. Because this is, I think, the second edition. So it had two editions, and I've, I've seen it in libraries all over the world. Like, it, it managed to... I think it's 90... Early 90s. Uh, it is yeah. early 90s. Right. I think it was... not. I think the first edition was 92, and then maybe this one's 94, but I can check that. Thank you. Well, amazing. We will come back. We we'll keep your questions until the end. We're going to hear from Janet now. Um, so over to you, Janet. Pick up. Thank you very much. Can I just check my audio is all right? I've been fiddling so much with my mute and unmute button. The novelty of it. Um, I wasn't sure if I was still muted. Um, and thank you, Paul, for the introduction. Thank you, Hannah, for that. Um, this the the picture book is absolutely gorgeous. So I do. Um, uh, recommend everyone to have a little look at it uh, if you. Uh, if you can, um, cause it's really a lovely thing to see. Um, oh, I'm going to have to Chris Whitty as well, aren't I? If our yeah, clicker I isn't working. <laughs> Sorry, could you move us on uh, one or two slides, probably? There we are. That will do for a moment. Um, so um, let me describe myself. Um, uh, I'm sitting just next to Hannah on the beautiful, vibrant pink chair. Um, I'm wearing a maroon T-shirt, and I've got long, uh, blondish uh, hair in a in a in a plait, which I think may now be attached to my microphone. I think they've now fused. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, very briefly about um, sort of picking up on that 
theme of activism, really, um, and a kind of hidden activism that's hidden in a, in a different way, really. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about prisons and HIV and activism there. Uh, activism in relation to prisons is often hidden because um, we, the general public, regularly don't really know much about what's going on inside prisons. And also because action or activism in relation to prisons frequently has to be a little bit, or certainly did have to be in relation to HIV, uh, has to be a little bit below the radar um, in and of itself. So it's sort of hidden uh, in a different way. Um, could you move me on to the next slide, please? I've only got a couple of slides, so it won't be too um, intrusive, I hope. Um, so prisons caused a lot of anxiety in the 80s and into the 90s in, in relation to HIV and AIDS um, for a whole myriad of reasons. Um, it was partly due to uh, fears about injecting drug use amongst people going into prisons. Um, a very rarely explicitly acknowledged uh, anxiety about people injecting inside prisons. Um, there were fears as well about sex between men in prisons and violence um, and the potential that that may have for spreading HIV. Some element of recognition as well that the prison medical service was perhaps not all that it could have been shall we say. Um, and then there's a kind of a generalised uh, anxiety about things like overcrowding in prisons and the need to maintain control, the need to maintain good order. Um, and anything like HIV or like panic about HIV that could interrupt that um, made sure that HIV and AIDS became quite a high priority uh, for a lot of prisons around the world. Um, and in terms of the perspective of uh, sort of national policy makers, prisons were often seen, uh, and I've seen this phrase used, as a reservoir of infection, uh, recognising that people would often only be in prison for a short time and would then go back into you know, the community and potentially be spreading um, HIV then. Now, in the sort of uh, panic-stricken uh, 1980s, uh, when HIV tests first became available and people in prisons started to be tested, some prisons, some prison systems, some individual prisons um, just released people who tested positive for HIV uh, because they did not know what to do with them and they were terrified, I think, in a lot of instances about what would happen if, if word spread within the prison that there was someone um, with HIV. And often people were released, I mean, it sounds quite nice, I guess, early release, but they were released very sort of unceremoniously um, with very little information for them or their families. Um, so it was uh, very abrupt um, and sort of panic infused. Um, there was a lot of discussion as well about trying to introduce compulsory testing for everybody in prison and some efforts um, to implement that with varying degrees of success. Um, and uh, prisons were also very keen in many instances on segregating people who had HIV or AIDS or who were suspected of having HIV or AIDS but refused a test. Um, and the image on the slide here is from a uh, Prison Reform Trust newsletter from 1988, um, which is sort of highlighting the problems um, that uh, I've described there um, and quoting people who've been in prison who've experienced some of this firsthand. So it was um, quite uh, widely recognised sort of within the um, prison policy and reform community. Um, it's worth saying, though, that um, the national and international guidance, national for the UK and international um, guidance from the WHO um, and the Council of Europe and so on, was 
um, very clear that there should be no compulsory testing and there should be no uh, segregation, no sort of automatic segregation uh, on the basis of HIV status because they were massively counterproductive um, uh, in that segregation in particular would give people a false sense of security that they could know um, who had HIV and who didn't. Uh, that uh, compulsory segregation would massively discourage voluntary testing um, and that it would massively increase the uh, stigma and fear around HIV and AIDS. Um, but nonetheless, uh, despite the sort of official policy line, uh, Wandsworth Prison in London maintained a viral infectivity restriction unit um, up until at least 1995, um, which was for people refusing HIV tests who were sort of viewed suspiciously, um, as well as people testing positive. And in Dublin, in the main prison in Dublin, there was also a segregation unit, a sort of basement uh, unit, which again was in existence well into the 90s. Um, Although interestingly, that unit, I've interviewed um, uh, a number of people who worked in that unit, and it does prompt quite mixed memories. There are a lot of very, very negative memories of it being sort of dank and depressing, um, with um, a lot of quite open drug use, terrible, terrible uh, mental health amongst the people held there. Um, but at the same time, from the perspective of the people who were working there at least, it did facilitate the provision of a lot of really targeted um, and tailored uh, counselling, much better medical treatment than was available elsewhere in the sort of main prison system. Um, and in some senses, uh, a more relaxed environment where people could um, speak more openly because everyone was in the same boat. Um, could you move me on to the next slide, please? Thanks. So those are the sort of um, uh, difficulties that prisons were facing. Um, and there was, in response to that, uh, a good degree of public and private um, activism, which could take many different forms. Some of it was very um, public. Uh, and the picture on the slide there is a newspaper clipping yeah, yeah. about an act up protest outside of Strangeways prison, um, where protesters were trying to um, get condoms over the wall uh, into the prison. Uh, and I think there was a similar protest outside Pentonville as well, using balloons to try to sort of airlift condoms into the prison. I mean, I don't think they were successful at all, but of course it got newspaper coverage and it helped to raise the profile um, of issues like access to condoms in prisons. So there was some very public uh, activism like that. There was also, um, uh, to some degree, very sort of active effort amongst people uh, in prison making complaints um, when services weren't available to them and even taking legal action. Um, there's one case in particular um, which I think made its way all the way to the High Court in the late 90s um, in England. Um, and it was a case brought, br brought by a prisoner called Glenn Fielding. Actually, I think he may have been out of prison by the time it finally worked its way all the way through the legal system. Um, but his case was to do with the provision of condoms again. Um, and the fact that he had been refused condoms by the prison doctor. Um, and the case was very much an effort to try to get clarity um, about what prison policy should be um, in relation to providing condoms. Um, it's, it's a sort of slightly mixed picture about whether it was successful or not. And I think that's often the case with these kinds of um, sort of prison-related um, actions, there isn't always a very clear trajectory of, you know, success and triumph. Um, so in that particular case, um, the, the judge found that 
um, there had been a mistake in relation to Glenn Fielding, um, and he should have been provided with condoms. But broadly speaking, everything was fine within the prison service, and that was just a one-off. Um, and a third form of activism uh, was amongst people working in prisons. Um, there are some really interesting examples from the 90s in Switzerland with prison doctors um, taking uh, what could have been, and in some cases were, I think, quite risky decisions in relation to their own careers. Um, and refusing to do things like report um, the results of HIV tests to the central prison administration. Um, doctors were refusing on the basis of doctor-patient confidentiality, um, which um, was quite challenging for prisons because usually in prisons um, it is the control aspect that, that uh, wins out over everything else. And um, up until that point, it would have um, trumped doctor-patient confidentiality. So there were some uh, individual doctors refusing to do this um, and sort of going public with this to try to force um, policy changes. And similarly with providing, um, again in Switzerland, providing clean injecting equipment uh, when they saw that people were injecting drugs while they were um, incarcerated and more likely than not sharing injecting equipment and putting themselves at risk. Obviously this um, was a fairly massive breach of uh, prison regulations, um, but some doctors did start providing sterile injecting equipment. Um, uh, moderately below the radar to sort of test the waters and, and um, see what the reaction would be and then increasingly going public within the medical community and then within the criminal justice community to try to use that to, um, to bring about change, changes in policy um, about the provision of sterile injecting equipment. So onto my last slide, please. Um, just a few last, last uh, thoughts uh, following on from that. Um, that injecting drug users um, uh, were very significantly affected um, by HIV and AIDS, and as we heard from Hannah as well, um, they often haven't been included as much in the, in the stories that we hear um, and in what is being remembered. Um, and there is uh, in uh, the oral history collection um, of the European HIV and AIDS archives, their logo is at the bottom of the slide there. Um, there's one particular memory that um, sticks in my mind, um, not my memory, but hearing it recounted um, of uh, an activist talking about going to a memorial in the, I think, early 90s for um, someone who had died of AIDS-related complications. And this was a memorial sort of organized um, by a community support group. Um, and talking to somebody else at that memorial, um, she heard about um, somebody's husband who had also died very recently, um, who had been an injecting drug user. And in the course of that conversation, she, she suddenly realized that she had not been to any memorials uh, for injecting drug users who had died um, as a result of HIV um, and AIDS. Um, and that that stood in really stark contrast to what was happening with the, um, with the gay community that she was also part of. Um, and the, um, the other image on this slide here is a memorial in Dublin. Um, which I'm very fond of. It doesn't. It's not actually um, sort of specifically um, referencing HIV, um, but it's a memorial to lives lost to heroin in the 80s and 90s. And in Dublin, those two um, sort of epidemics overlapped hugely: um, the heroin epidemic and the HIV epidemic in the 80s, in particular. Um, so uh, I included it there as an example of a physical memorial. Um, that is remembering uh, that community that often does get forgotten. 
Um, and it's worth saying as well that things like the European HIV AIDS Archive are also doing a wonderful job of trying to bring together a really uh, wide range of resources and oral histories to, um, from as uh, wide ranging and representative um, a group as possible. Um, so hopefully in future there will be a much broader array of histories of HIV being remembered. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Jenna. Amazing. So much, so much richness. I mean, you can tell that you've done so much research, and that's just the tip of the iceberg on that, isn't it? Um, I have to say, it's quite strange for me personally listening to this because I realise that this is a history that I've been a practitioner in. So when you're talking about dental dams, I, you probably remember I mentioned that my first job in sexual health was at the University of Sussex. We actually had a drop-in centre mm -hmm. at that uh, at Sussex, which was for free condoms, pregnancy tests, and we were all students who were trained up to deliver pregnancy tests, and, and we also sold Passante dental dams. I must have been in that little strange mm -hmm. window when they were available, but actually I don't think I ever sold a single one or gave mm -hmm. a single one away, which probably is, is a testament to what you've been saying. Mm -hmm. um, but interestingly, that they were talked about as a potential use for gay men to use for rimming or mm -hmm. analingus. Yeah, the, the monkeypox um, kind of, there was there was some chat about, because of the way that that was particularly kind of sexualized by the press and everything, they were talked about as a kind of potential pre preventative measure, which is why I said they're kind of, they have a kind of rise and fall in popularity mm -hmm. and chat, but sometimes it's quite hard to measure how much people are using them rather than talking about them. Mm -hmm. um, I was still giving them out as part of kind of uh, sexual health activism when I was at Manchester, until I think it was about 2010, and then right. suddenly student health services were like, we're not buying these anymore. And we were like, why? And they were like, no one takes them. No one wants them. They yes. leave them behind. They, they open the little sexual health packet that contained like condoms and lube, and then they take out those things, and then they were leaving behind the dental dams. Yeah, and they're um, quite expensive, I think, actually, to both to produce and although they're just made of And you can latex, just make them. Right? Yeah. You can just make them. You can make them from a, a, a vinyl or a latex glove, or you can make them by kind of cutting a condom up. Like so, why create? You were going to bring one, right? There was a conversation about bringing one. I was, I was going to bring one show you all in <laughs> that I had to buy from Australia because I couldn't get one right. in the uh, in the UK, um, and no one I knew that worked at sexual health clinics had any kind of sculling about the place that they could yeah, hand okay. over. Um, but yeah, it was a very berry flavored. It's about they're about this big. It's bright purple. Yeah. I mean, the part of this history is actually, if I, I'm thinking aloud here, but part of this is related to the history of flavoured condoms, mm. when flavoured condoms were also promoted as a tool for oral sex, and that was mm -hmm. all about you know, the relative risk of oral sex for HIV transmission, which was something that I was always asked about, both in my student activist days and even in my NHS days. And so it's sort of related to oh that. Yeah, you no, know, there's lots of this sort of berry-flavoured pieces of latex going around that nobody, I don't think, really used for the purpose it was certainly intended. And there was um, pushback in the queer women's kind of sex positive communities against flavoring these things because they they were uncomfortable with this idea of not being okay with like the way that flesh tastes and mm. wanting mm. to flavor things as a way of like desexualizing mm. sex and there's there's debates about should we be flavoring things and stuff like that that was ongoing as part of this kind of um fight between the people who were the kind of the latex lesbians as they were pejoratively known by the kind of no latex mm. uh, thing but yeah it was a complicated fight definitely and yeah flavors came under um well they came in for some criticism partly because they people would people would open a packet and it would smell really weird mm. Mm. and then people would comment on it as part <laughs> of this like how are we going to get people to use these things when this thing that's supposed to smell of vanilla smells like a marigold rubber glove <laughs> <laughs> like it's not sexy i mean it is to some people but yeah, not to yeah, everybody I mean, you know, i'm <laughs> sure it was to some people right um <laughs> i could i could continue this conversation for ages but i'm very conscious we've got uh, 20 minutes or so and i really would like to take some questions from the audience the way we're going to do this as you remember is that there is a roving mic i think uh so if you've got the roving mic all right cool um and uh if you've got a question please do feel free to put your hand up and we'll just wait till the mics come to you this one down here at the front, and then we'll come to you at the back. And oh, there's quite a few. This is great. Thank you. I'll try and keep this quick. Thank you both for your talks. Um, obviously, 1981 doesn't mark the beginning, but it's the beginning of the recognized mm -hmm. epidemic. 
I noticed that both of you uh, focused mostly on examples before the rise of a highly active antiretroviral therapy. Mm -hmm. Now the epidemic has lasted long enough that more of it is in the post-heart era. Um, I wondered whether each of you could speak to um, both whether you feel it is vitally important to flesh out the early heart pre-heart era and whether heart changes the hiddenness slightly. Thank you. And just before we move on to that, just, just for, the, for those watching at home, for those of you who don't know, that the antiretroviral therapy, which essentially came in in 1996 and transformed HIV from a, from a, um, a, a fatal diagnosis to a, a long-term chronic condition, uh, that really marks a, a sort of milestone and a watershed in the history of HIV, sort of from the ni from 96 onwards. Um, who wants to take that first? <laughs> <Go>. <laughs> that was very definitive. Very, very decisive. <laughs> well, I had nothing to say about dental dams, but you know, <laughs> I can chip in now. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting point, um, and I think that is going to be, um, a, uh, it's going to sort of stick around as a huge milestone, as a huge turning point. I do think the earlier um, period is uh, well worth revisiting, though, um, because I think it's easy to forget the 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 extent of of panic and fear and uncertainty which we were talking about earlier um that that there really i mean there was a huge amount of of discrimination and and stigma and and awfulness but there was also genuine genuine um uncertainty uh for a time about uh about transmission and risk and so on, and that did make it very, very difficult um, for um, well for everyone. Um, but you know, thinking about about prisons, like what, uh, how should a prison uh, governor manage um, a couple of people in their building with HIV when you really don't know how it is transmitted? Um, and uh, it was such a, there were so many sort of um, rapid changes in knowledge in terms of the testing, first of all, um, then more clarity um, about what was actually happening. And then with the treatments that I think it's, it's easy to forget just, just how much uncertainty and fear there was. And the, the sort of lingering, the lasting effect that that has um, on the people involved and, you know, on the sort of wider perception that mm. still, that is still around today, mm. um, that that really had such a, a huge impact. Yeah, I think, I think it's really important to always question why we as historians have found it so hard to move past sort of 95, 97. Um, and I'm guilty of it myself. My PhD stopped at 97. I didn't look beyond that. I, my new project does look beyond that. But for me, the reason why I'm so interested in looking back in this moment of, of crisis and fear and uncertainty is to disrupt that that is the lasting memory. You know, like if you talk to uh, most members of the British public about HIV, the first thing they'll try and say to you is about the Tombstone campaign, this horrible lasting memory. People try and tell you it's good. Why is it good? The only thing you can remember is being frightened. But actually, if you look back and you look at the love and the care and the activism that went on in this time of total like crisis, this, oh gosh, what do we do? It really gives me hope because people did this, people did so much amazing stuff to fight back against all of that fear and that uncertainty, which is why it's important for me to show like horrible Daily Mail articles because we need to know what happened to really understand like what people were fighting against and the amazing activism and love and care that people were able to kind of give to just their friends and their family and these kind of small scale activisms of the, like the family wide group that I mentioned briefly but also like you know a mum deciding that her child didn't have a picture book that told her uh, about HIV in a way that was intelligible so she didn't just make it for herself she made it for the other women around her the other parents around her that needed a resource like that like that that in a in a moment of crisis just makes me think like activism works like just because we haven't remembered all of the activism that worked 
some of those really small scale things like someone literally just like making someone a cup of tea that that is what this history can tell us and if we just look at the history where it's this kind of post effective drug moment we give too much history to um the the researchers and the doctors that were involved in it and not enough research not enough history to the kind of patients and the activists that kind of looked after themselves or the doctors and the social workers that fought with them so that's why it's still important to me but i do feel conflicted about this concentration on that kind of pre h a a o t moment thanks um interestingly when i started working on the uh, do it london campaign in 2015 my then boss, and it was in the local government because public health had just shifted to uh, local government from the NHS. My boss, who's retired now, was a social worker in the 80s. And I remember saying, we've got to produce these new HIV prevention campaigns for London. Bear in mind, it was only seven, eight years ago. And she said, I want to see icebergs and tombstones on the tube. And that's, I remember, I always remember her saying that. Um, there's a question on the back row, I think. And then, we'll, yeah, so we'll come to the question there. And then we'll come this way. Was there one yet? You did, yeah. Thank you. Thank you both for your, your really interesting presentations. Um, I, I had a question. I think you've actually kind of answered it already, but it was um, it was just directed to you, um, Janet. You were mentioning that one of the, at least one of the interventions they had at the time were the condoms, and they were really significant, like leading to the, high the, to the court battle. But um, was there anything else, that just given how you were mentioning it's sort of a reservoir and how it, it could affect the local community and the families and um, was there anything else in the way of levers they could have used anything in terms of health education or, or um, anything else you found that could have worked but didn't work <laughs> <laughs> there's yeah thank you that's an interesting question there is um, uh, an example of um, a pilot study in the 90s, and I can't remember exactly when, but it was a pilot study to investigate the um, uh, logistics, if you like, of making freely available within prisons condoms and um, bleach, I think in sort of tablet form, before sterilizing injecting equipment. So to have things like vending machines where people could just go and you know help themselves without having to um, ask anyone. So there was a pilot study to investigate those two um, uh, options uh, for reasons that I have not been able to find specified. Um, condoms were removed from the pilot study at, uh, before it began. So it was just the bleach that ran. The study ran. It found that um, all of the things that people feared would go wrong, that people would sort of use these for other purposes, for you know, weapons, or I don't know, um, didn't happen. There was no sort of appreciable uh, increase in people injecting or any associated problems. It seemed to be perfectly safe, perfectly functional. Um, and then it was just never followed up. Um, I think the, the facilities remained in the prison, or prisons, might have been a couple, um, where they'd been piloted, but fairly quickly people stopped maintaining them, stopped filling them, stopped checking them, and they just fell into disrepair. Um, and and it, yeah, it just, it just sort of fell by the wayside, I think, as a um, sort of politically um, unpalatable thing to offer. Um, I did have another example. Oh yes, you're asking about um, the sort of education. There was actually some some quite quite good efforts at providing education. There were a couple of people in the um, prison service for England and Wales who were very active and very passionate and worked really hard to try to um, educate staff as well as. Um, uh, people who are incarcerated, so there was some 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 quite good efforts in those lines, I think, um, and certainly for a while in the nineties there was um, a sort of standard package of education um, about HIV that staff and people entering the prison system would receive. Thanks. 
Um, there were more questions. Can you just make yourselves known to me? So some down. Oh, gosh, there's lots. Okay. Shall we go over this corner? There was a gentleman there. Yeah, yeah thanks. I, I was just going to ask, um, ho hopefully people have watched it to sin, so they may have different thoughts. I can't remember the main character. Is it Jenny or? Jane. Jane, yes. So they may have different thoughts about um, HIV. Um, I was going to ask, do we know um, about prisons, whether more than average people went into prison with HIV or AIDS? And do we know the sort of how much people came out? Did, they, did lots of people catch HIV or AIDS in prison? Mm. Uh, uh, and also, um, can you get condoms and needles in prison now? You mentioned like the bleach things. So I suppose that could measure whether the court case was successful or not. Because mm. if you can, then it was successful. If you can't, then it's then it's not. Um, I uh, uh, my my get out uh, um, excuse of being a historian, so I'm not necessarily um, very up to date on what the situation is right now. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not in prison. The last <laughs> the last I checked, I think the prison policy for England and Wales was still that condoms should be made available. Um, uh, yeah, they should be made available, but exactly um, how how easily available they are might be a very different question. And I think it can vary a lot. Certainly it could in the 90s and 2000s. It varied a lot between different prisons and the, the, the attitudes of the governors and the medical staff, how comfortable they felt with that. Um, and injecting, sterile injecting equipment, no, absolutely not, not. No, nothing, nothing in the UK, um, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. it, it's always been um, uh, extremely, extremely controversial. It's never really um, made any inroads. In terms of uh, sort of um, infection rates, there was one, um, there was one incident in particular that sort of terrified um, uh, prison administrators in the early 90s, it was in Scotland actually, um, uh, a, there was um, a sort of a, a recognised outbreak of HIV um, within a prison in Scotland, um, probably from shared injecting mm -hmm. equipment. Um, it was sort of very well documented in epidemiological terms, it was proven. Um, and that did, um, I think, uh, sharpen the attention a little bit mm -hmm. of the prison service in terms of um, what they could be doing to provide information. <laughs> oh, not clean needles or anything, but you know. Um, so there was one documented case of an HIV outbreak within a prison. Um, very little information otherwise, because there was never any um, really widespread um, testing. Um, but from research in other countries, it certainly seemed as though rates of HIV um, within prison populations did tend to be higher mm -hmm. than in the general population. It varied massively, like how much, like a little bit higher or a lot higher. Um, it varied a lot place to place and prison to prison. Yeah, I mean, it was one of the challenges in Scotland with the IV drug using population um, when they were then in like when the, later on when they were in, involved in uh, medical trials to try and um, find like workable antiretroviral drugs um, there would be points where they wouldn't turn up to an appointment and it would transpire that they had been incarcerated and then the doctors and the social workers would have a, a trouble trying to get hold of um, their patient to kind of keep them enrolled within this trial because then they were kind of um, kind of rocking up against kind of prison system so there was a lot of negotiation going on um in scotland where some of the the key trials were taking place around um the the kind of the what well what the prison service saw as prisoners and what the hospital kind of research services were seeing as patients um and trying to make those two kind of systems speak to each other and work together um and yeah, I'm never, I, I, I'm never quite sure like where those records sit as well because they're not necessarily easy to access in terms of kind of archives um, to find out what went down. Um, so you you hear it talked about in oral histories where doctors talk about like trying to keep people on their trials, but um, the pr prisons are quite difficult to do research on, <laughs> as Janet will attest. Um, so yeah, so there's lots to follow up within these kind of things created by this prison service and these fears around HIV. Thanks. Uh, 
I think we've got two on the front row here. So we come down to Drew and then we'll come to you. Yeah. Can I just questions. do an online question? Oh, yeah, you? sure. Sorry. Uh, Thank you. Apologies to online. We've got so many questions. We haven't forgotten you. I should I also apologise that the text to speak, I know it sort of conked out slightly halfway through, but <laughs> apologies for that. Go for it. What's the online question before so we So Chris online says, what other histories about HIV AIDS in the UK do you think still need to be told? Where are the gaps in our knowledge and archives? That's a great question. Who wants mm. to start with that one? Gaps in knowledge and archives. <laughs> <laughs> maybe the answer is yeah. that we, maybe we don't know. Maybe we need to. Uh, we don't know because there are gaps, but I don't know. I think there is an element of that, and I think. Um, I mean, I think the the kinds of small um, support groups and mm. um, uh, s small community groups that sprang up in huge numbers all over the place. <laughs> Um, focusing on all different kinds of um, segments of the population. Um, very often, I mean, we know about the things like Terence Higgins Trust that, you know, turned into a very large, well-established organisation that's still around. Mm. But the small support groups and, and charities that, um, that didn't uh, continue and have a long life um, it's very, very hard to find out any information about a lot of those, mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, things that were run um, very informally by volunteers. They don't have um, any kind of paper trail, mm. as far as I know. Um, and um, I think very often people, uh, as their lives moved on, didn't, d maybe didn't feel that it was important enough mm. um, to be worth you know um uh you know keeping those papers or mm. giving them to an archive mm. or sort of putting themselves forward as someone with a, a story to tell so yeah i think um those kinds of small groups um and i think as well i mean something that neither of us have really mentioned is um uh, uh people who are racialized and migrants to the uk mm -hmm. um and i <laughs> Uh, there were, you know, as as Paul, as you mentioned at the beginning mm. about the people that you were seeing in your um, in your work. There's uh, there's there's a huge story there, I think, um, that is quite hard to uncover, and especially in the current climate, um, the current sort of um, attitudes towards immigration that we have uh, in the country as a whole. Um, uh, I think there's yeah there's lots of um, stories there that are completely missing, but there are more and more people collecting new oral histories. There's new archives trying to work hard to collect things. So um, I think there's so much more work to be done on ensuring that we make space and celebrate the kind of histories of activism of um, kind of minoritized communities within the minoritized communities. Um, and like I'm a I'm, I I mainly have kind of changed my focus towards looking at regional history and I'm really interested in kind of capturing sort of rural rural histories of HIV and AIDS for instance um, which there's been some work on in like the United States to kind of capture those the differences between living with HIV when you are a part of a kind of an urban community versus a rural community but we've not seen that same um, interrogation of those histories um, in the UK and those groups did exist you know like pe people worked in kind of very very rural Cornwall to make sure that there was somewhere to go and someone to talk to um, and they're they're all part of of this this history there's there has been a tendency to focus on London for, for obvious reasons um, in the histories that we have written thus far in the UK and so um, obviously me and Janet have been talking about uh, other histories but I think that for me is one of the best ways of capturing the kind of the wider variety of people who've been affected um, by HIV and AIDS and I think for me like um, I will say this plug I am partly a historian of childhood histories of children affected by HIV and AIDS and teenagers affected like growing up with a HIV in their community or within their in their families, I think those histories we really need to give more space to because um, we often write it as an adult history, and it, it doesn't need it isn't because children know people or children grow up with it, and I think that that is a history that still needs so much more work. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, there's so much going on. There's so many new histories being written that it, it, we're, we're not, we're not going to mess this up. It's, it's going to happen. People are giving testimony, giving oral, oral histories. Activism is happening. Thing, you know, memorials are being created. Mm. So there's one being created just down the road to Tottenham Court Road, mm -hmm. any in in the next few months, I believe. Um, I'm really conscious of time. Will you indulge me for five more minutes, people? Oh, if I, okay, okay, good. <laughs> so, can we come down here and then we'll come here? So, to Drew on the front row here. Thank you. Thank you both so much. This is incredible and so important to hear about these histories that you said are not hidden histories. They are there, but they just need to be talked about more. I'm curious, in both of the communities or in all of the communities that you both study, how you have seen some of the tactics and infrastructure built out of the HIV and AIDS movement to evolve and encompass other public health priorities for these communities and others. For example, hepatitis C and other types of um, conditions that are potentially more stigmatized and harder for communities to get more mainstream support for. Mm, that's an interesting question. I have a, a very kind of um, sort of quick and um, broad answer which is that at least with the prison service for England and Wales, um, the, the arrival of HIV um, played a huge part, I think, in getting the prison medical service um, uh, integrated into the NHS. So there used to be a totally separate medical service for prisons. Um, and all of the, the, um, the anxiety about HIV and also the activism and, and action um, did play a big role in um, changing the way that medical services were provided to people in prison. So it's kind of a broad brush rather than adopting tactics for a specific public health problem. It's kind of a, uh, an overarching um, issue of um, how to provide healthcare to people in prison um, and making sure that that's provided by the same service providers that are uh, working elsewhere in the community. Yeah, so I think the example that I can give is that I think a lot of um, doctors and kind of social workers learned from the how do we tell children about HIV um, and learned how to deal with other difficult um, kind of intergenerational health crises um, with children um, from learning from HIV. The difference that HIV brought to the what do we tell the children about the big scary illness is if that child then went into school and said, my mum has HIV, that could cause a huge issue for kind of stigma because it was a stigmatised disease in a way that a child going in and saying, my mum has cancer, didn't have quite the same potential um, to have like kind of greater fallout. So I think that the things that activists did, like creating things like this, I think a lot of uh, doctors and social workers actually learn from um, and I think that 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 patient activism that we don't have the resources we will produce the resources you can see in other kind of queer um, health conditions and kind of queer resources whether it's about like talking about different ways of like creating family and creating community I think you can see some of those lessons being learned um, but that's it's not I, like, I can't speak to kind of specifically about um, hepatitis unless I was were to sort of go into great depth about um, hemophiliac communities and how that how they dealt with the kind of intergenerational health crisis within their communities. But yeah, I think I think that that kind of watching um, pediatricians and the families that they worked with work together to create resources and then seeing it over and over and over again with different diseases would be the one that I would kind of reach for. Thanks. We had a question here, you think? Uh, so was there, I feel like there's one final question over here. Was there? Yes, on the back row. Hi. Um, w one of the uh, posters, the one uh, from uh, Australia, uh, has the slogan, new fit for every hit. And uh, it's, it's about uh, sharing injecting equipment, but it, it isn't explicit about whether the injecting equipment as a whole is involved or whether it's just the needles. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, Anna, you, you use the term needle sharing and you use the term needle quite a lot, whereas, Janet, you use the term 
injecting equipment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think um, because a lot of people, uh, certainly in, in developing countries where I've worked, still think that, that uh, you only need to change the needle. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, it's uh, very important to, to uh, distinguish uh, you know, um, among the terminology. Uh, I, I wonder if, if the term needle sharing is, is kind of uh, outdated or, or does it come from a particular, um, you know, a particular background, like, uh, uh, like CDC, for example, mm -hmm. didn't distinguish for a long time. Yeah, I suspect it's it's me being um, immersed within the kind of language of the kind of 1980s, 1990s, mm. and specifically um, Edinburgh and like sort of Scottish discussions around this. And like the fact that, you know, people spoke of needle exchanges and things like that. And they meant the whole mm. injecting equipment setup and all of the in the pamphlets and the information would would like talk about either how to completely clean your injecting equipment, where to get new injecting equipment, how to dispose of your um, injecting equipment safely. But usually when they were trying to grab the attention of, of drug users, they would use terms like jags or needles. Um, so, yeah, it will be the primary sources in, invading my language and my brain mm. and um, making me not as specific as I should be, definitely. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's an interesting point. I will be more watchful about it. Mm, it is a really interesting point, actually. It's made me wonder if the prison, uh, prison service, or at least some people within the prison service, were very careful to always say injecting equipment, because mm -hmm. it sounds sort of safely technical, uh, you know, specialist equipment, whereas needles. Um, you know, it brings, it brings frightening things to mind from the perspective of prison administrators. So, <laughs> yeah, possibly, uh, yeah, possibly we're both reflecting what we've read. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th th they definitely, when, news when newspapers want to kind of tell horror stories, they always use terms like needles, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so maybe it, I've been reading too many too many horror stories. <laughs> too many horror stories. Too many tabloids. That is your job, though. To be fair, <laughs> so I think. Do we have any uh, last uh, online questions, or are we are we okay? Right. Did we have any more questions in the room before we wrap up? Yes. We could have stayed here all day. I'm sure that it's such a rich area for conversation, and I think you guys are going to stay around for a little bit, maybe mm -hmm. at yeah. the end, if you want to come up. Can we just say a huge appreciative thank you to Hannah and Jenna for their <laughs> amazing presentations? Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, I, my last message to you is that there is a comments card on your chair, and if you want to fill it in to give us some feedback, mm -hmm. um, please do. You'll also apparently be sent an e-survey, no which relates to your booking. Um, but thank you very much for coming today. It's been really great. I really appreciate it. And uh, come again to the welcome. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for coming and listening to us. <laughs> yeah, I was going to fill out the feedback. <laughs> Seriously.